Alright guys, welcome back. In this video we are doing another example on column buckling. In this case we have a three-dimensional column that has a fixed connection at both ends. Uh, so very similar to the last video, if you watched it, we had basically this exact same problem, only it was pinned with ball and socket joints at each end. This time we're talking about fixed ends, and that's going to change our effective length that we're dealing with. Now if you remember from a couple of videos ago, we had uh, been talking about this stuff, our different situations where we had like pin, pin, fixed end, and free end, a fixed end with a pin end, and a fixed end with a fixed end. Well, this is the situation that we have here in this video. So we're saying that that means that our effective length is going to be equal to 0 0.5 times the actual length. Um, and so in this case, our actual length is three meters. And so our effective length uh, maybe let's not draw an equal sign, let's draw an arrow. So we have our effective length is going to be equal to 0.5L, so that's 1.5 meters. All right, and that is coming directly from that last, not that last video, but a couple of videos ago where we talked about that. Okay, so when we start talking about this for buckling, um, it's this column can, it, as a rectangular column, it can buckle in two different directions or planes, basically. It can buckle in the YZ plane, basically going out that way or coming this way. And it can buckle in the XZ plane, so basically kind of going into the page like that or out of the page like this. So we need to check uh, what the critical load is for each uh, possible direction it can buckle in. And then from there, we can use a factor of safety to determine the allowable load. And then after, we'll also check to make sure that this thing, to see if it's yielding before it's buckling or whatever. All right, so the formula that we need to use, uh, just like the last couple of videos, was uh, P is equal to P crit is, uh, is equal to pi squared EI over L e squared, right? The effective length squared. So in this case, we do need to identify the moment of inertia that we're going to be using in each direction. So for buckling in the yz plane, just like the last video, we need to find the moment of inertia about the y-axis. And then for buckling in the xz plane, so this way, we need to find the moment of inertia about the x-axis. And we did calculate those in the last video, so I'll just write them right here. And then we want to use each of these when we calculate for buckling in each of the planes. So let's take a look at buckling in the YZ plane first. So we want to figure out what the P critical is in order for that buckling to happen. So then we're going to have to use the subscript here for I, Y, moment of inertia about the Y axis when we're dealing with buckling going like that. All right, so when we, we have all of these values, we have the effective length, we have the moment of inertia, we have E, we have pi, obviously. Um, so we're gonna find that the P critical in the Y, Z direction is 23.4 kilonewtons. And now we wanna repeat the process to find uh, the critical load for buckling in the X, Z axis. So let's throw in some subscripts here, X, Z, and this time we need to be using the moment of inertia about the X axis, so we have subscript x up here. All right, so when we go and plug in all of those numbers, we're going to find that the critical load for buckling in the x, z axis is 93.6 kilonewtons. So now what we do is we select the smaller load as our actual critical load, because obviously if you surpass the smaller load uh, to get up to the bigger load, you already would have buckled in that, uh, in that direction or in that plane. So what we do is we take this, and if we're asked to find the allowable load for buckling with some safety factor, we can do that. Um, we just take our factor of safety, uh, which is equal to the ultimate load over the allowable load. So we can just rearrange that so we get our allowable load is going to be uh, is going to be equal to 23.4 kilonewtons um, over a factor of safety, which is 2.5. All right, and uh, that works out to be 9.3. 36 kilonewtons. So with a factor of safety of 2.5, then we can uh, then we can safely support this uh, um, compressive load here of 9.36 kilonewtons. Um, now, something that we should do is just like the, exactly like we talked about in the last video is we should check that um, that we're not at risk of yielding with this applied load. So let's just give ourselves a little bit more space down here. 
Um, we know that the yield stress for this material and this problem is 250 megapascals. And we also know that um, stress is equal to force divided by area. So we have P over A. And in this case, for yield stress, that is our ultimate strength or our ultimate load here. So we can say PY or P ultimate, whatever. It's the load that's going to make the material yield. So what we do is we just have to rearrange this to solve for PY. So we know that the area uh, up here, the cross-sectional area is 800 millimeters squared. So we get 250 times 10 to the 6 uh, newtons per meter squared. That's megapascals times our area, which is just 800 times 10 to the negative 6 meters squared. And, and that's going to be equal to 200,000 newtons, uh, which is 200 kilonewtons. And uh, basically, this material, when we look at this, this material yields will yield when we apply uh, 200 kilonewtons to this exact column. Um, and that's actually, that's way more than uh, if we applied only 23.4 and it's going to buckle. So it's safe to say that this column will buckle um, in the YZ direction or plane before it even buckles in the XZ plane and before it yields due to compression.